Well, let me just say, uh, John said, what would Cummings and some of the other early archaeologists think about giving lectures on the internet? And if I think if they understood that they could go drink a beer, have a margarita, or have a martini while the speaker spoke, and if got real boring, could sleep and even snore without bothering people, I think they, th they would think this technology was absolutely spectacular. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of uh, interest in archaeology now about relationships between different areas. Um, Kathy Cameron gave a really wonderful talk the other day on a Amarin webinar about migrations. And there are some really fantastic examples of people moving over fairly long distances and affecting other areas. I want to talk about a uh, relationship that people have thought about uh, between the Mimbres and Pacime, Mimbres of Southwest New Mexico and Pacime of Northwest Mexico, and explore the kinds of relationships. But to do that, I think we need to look at um, two background issues that really affect how we look at uh, particularly Pacume, but also Mimbres. The first is the perception of le uh, lesser known archeological areas like uh, Mugion and Casas Grandes. And the second is a uh, differing interpretive, interpretive histories of Southwest Mexico. This is the picture you've all seen many times of the three main culture areas in the Northwest Southwest, the ancestral Pueblo, Ho, Com, and, and Mugion. And I've spent almost my entire career working in the Mugion area, and I come to detest the concept of Mugion. When Howard he set it up, he meant a, a certain set of characteristics in an area up to AD 1000. After that, he wouldn't call it Mugion. Well, since Howry, it's just become anything, in my mind, south of the ancestral Pueblo and east of the Ho Com. It's a big blob. If you try to look at up in the uh, Point of Pines area or Membrace or the Horonado Mugion or Pacime, and this even has a Trinchetta era, there's so much variability that I think Mugion uh, loses any meaning whatsoever. But the fact that Membrace and Pacime are shown in this same culture area tends to have people think about them uh, being um, uh, similar. And so I hate Mugion. Another background issue is how people look at, at the Southwest and Mesoamerica. There are a lot of Mesoamericanists, almost none of them care anything about the Southwest or Northern Mexico. And there are lots of Southwestern archeologists. And what they care about is how ideas, uh, iconography, religion, goods, et cetera, that came from Mesoamerica, how they got to the Southwest and became so important. And I think this map, this map really sort of shows how people think about it. You have the Southwest and you have Me Mesoamerica and just a big blank in between. And so it looks like it's just a connection between the two with nothing in the intervening area. Whereas as Ben Nelson has shown in this wonderful map of uh, archeological traditions in Northern Mexico, <coughs> there's a great deal of variability. The uh, Chalchuites, Atzlan, Rio Sonora, Casas Grandes, Trinchera, Guadabampo, there's just a lot of interesting archeology span that's not well known because there haven't been many archeologists uh, working in Northern Mexico. There's a lot in Mesoamerica and there's a lot in the US Southwest, but the intervening area has largely been north ignored until recently by most American archeologists and actually most Mexican archeologists. So it's a very complicated area. So you would expect that whatever the connections are between the far end of this area that is the Southwest and the heartland in Mesoamerica would be fairly complicated. And so we have to keep that in mind. So we have to understand the local setting and what's happening in each of these areas and not just see it as some passive conduit for uh, corn and uh, uh, other things coming north. Well, specific to Mimbres and Pacime, I think there's, a, uh, there's something, a characteristic that is presumed population sizes that really is at the foundation of how people see, have posited the connections between Mimbres and Pacime. So the classic Mimbres period at AD 1000 was a very vibrant time as we know. Presumption was that there's a lot of people, around 1130 more or less, it collapsed or transformed. Anyway, there were major transformations and the post Mimbres in the area of Southwest New Mexico uh, didn't have as many people. Where did they go or did this all die off? Whereas in the Casas Grandes area, 
before the medial period, which is Casas Grandis's rise, with Pachyme's rise, the earlier Viejo period, people have assumed had very few people, and then the medio had a boom of enormous number of people. And so number of people have thought, it's logical, that as the membrane system transformed or fell apart, membranes, the ex membrane populations moved out of the valley and moved into Casas Grandis. Well, let's just do some background. Most people I think know about membrace and Pachyme, but let's just do some background for those that don't. The classic membrace is focused on the membrace valley of Southwest New Mexico, up and starting up the Gila wilderness and dumping down into the Deming Plains. It's also there are membrace sites in Chihuahua, whatever membrace site is, and they're in Western and east of, they're east and west of the Membrace Valley. But the big sites tend to be in the Gila or in the Membrace Valley. Here's a beautiful shot of this wonderful little valley for agriculture with large sites. This is what's left of called the Galaz site, one of probably the largest sites in the Membrace Valley that was destroyed by Frank Turley as, as he was looting for pottery. So many, so many uh, pages out of the history of Membrace have been destroyed by looting. But there has been some research. Uh, this is the kind of architecture, uh, rectangular, cobble or square, cobble walled rooms. Uh, what's interesting about Membrace is there's a lot of variability in the layout. Schwartz Ruin has two large compact room blocks. Galaz site has a uh, large uh, room blocks scattered about, and so is the Matic. So there's not one plan about how these sites are to be organized. And of course, Membrace is known for its incredible pottery. Really spectacular stuff. Don't ask me any questions about pottery. I don't know anything about pottery. Pachyme is later, around 1200 to maybe 1450, give or take 50, 50 years on either side. It's a site that was one of the first ones recorded by Spanish explorers. Uh, Balpavar de Obregón saw it and was blown away by it and talks about it in his memoir. And for 500 years, people thought, gee, this is a really an amazing site. And here it is today. There's a nice museum. If you haven't been down there, you ought to go. It's a beautiful museum. Uh, here's the old colonial town of Casas Grandes, and there's the new town of Nuevo Casas Grandes. It's a wonderful place, place to visit. And here is how Pachyme looks today. And it looks that way because of the joint Casas Grandes expedition run by the Ameren Foundation and ENA, the Mexican agency. And it was an enormous three-year project uh, and dangerous, as you can see, with this uh, photo tower. Uh, and what it revealed is what people thought for a very long time, and that is it was an amazing site. It's not only large, but it had what we technically call in archaeology the cool stuff. Four and a half million shell artifacts, amazing polychrome pottery, nice big Ramos polychrome, 600 pieces of copper, uh, ground stone, this is an altar in the shape of an eye door, uh, incredibly well made. That's not cast, but that's ground stone. And most famously, the scarlet macaws and the other kinds of macaws. And there may be fewer than were originally thought, but still it was a center of macaw production and how they kept and raised uh, uh, these birds, these tropical birds in the cold deserts of Chihuahua is an amazing thing. So this is what gets people's attention and it gets deservedly so. But there's also the not so cool stuff, which is very important. Just quickly to remind people, uh, those are turkeys and the turkeys were not eaten and there are as many turkey burials as macaw burials. There are as many turkey pens as macaw pens. And so turkeys may have been as important as macaws to the people of Pakime. Ground stone, the matates, the archeological artifact that gets no respect. These are the type 1A1 matates being, uh, that were cleaned and being prepared at the Amarin to go back to Mexico to be stored. And they're just amazingly well-made matates, probably by specialists. And we have ball courts and platform mounds, but we also have other ritual uh, features like this oven. This is probably the largest earthen oven in the Northwest Southwest. <coughs> We estimate that it could, they could have cooked somewhere around 7,000 pounds of agave at each time, probably to feed a large number of people coming to Casas Grandes. It was not only a living community with thousands of people, but it was clearly the ritual and political and economic center of the area. And things like, here's Pakime and here's the farmland. Pakime is incredibly well suited for agriculture, which we have argued 
was particularly important, allowing it to gain its predominance because it could build up surpluses that could then be used for uh, feasts and other events. And so even though these aren't as aesthetically pleasing perhaps as turquoise or macaws uh, or things like that, uh, shell, these are probably as important, perhaps not even more important than some of the cool stuff. It's an amazing site. You should go down and visit. Uh, my colleague Mike William and I uh, did a lot of survey. We recorded lots of sites. We recorded 350 medio period sites in outlying areas. Um, and so Pakime is not the only thing. It's the largest site by far, but there are a lot of other sites and there are other uh, features. This is an oven out there. We know about 40 or 50 of these ovens that are out about the landscape in various places. Here's a, one of about 20 ball courts that are known. You can see the line on either side, the flat, playing area with the people. Ramos polychrome. There are mountaintop shrines, hilltop shrines, or communication systems called atalayas, and here's one of them. And there are some other sites. This is one of the two largest sites that we recorded outside of Pakime. These are mounds that are uh, decayed room blocks, large room blocks, agricultural fields, a ball court, and here's a big oven, sort of like that, but even fancier, and another ceremonial oven. And so there are actually a lot of sites in the outlying area. And our, our, the, our primary goal for all those years was to put it in context. Uh, let's just well, quickly go through this again. Uh, here are the sites we worked on. We worked on uh, four sites in the sort of the hinterlandy area, two sites right next to Pakime, fortunately somehow survived all the uh, construction and farming and land modifications since Spanish. And then after I left, uh, Mike Whalen excavated uh, three more small sites. And so that's the kind of sample, just to give you an idea. This is one of the small little hamlets where most of the people live. It's Pakime style adobe architecture, but it's not very fancy. Here's another small site and you can see one of the rooms. And here is a special ceremonial site with the largest ball court outside of Pakime. And the only platform mound we know about outside of Pakime from the 350 sites we recorded. And here's another large site with a room block of about 200 rooms, a couple of other small room blocks, right where there's a pass between one valley and another. And so there's a lot of sites, a lot of things going on that we've only been able to get just the, the close, the, the simplest, crudest hints about. So let's go back to the population estimates, which I think perhaps over, uh, overemphasize what may be differences. There is some question about whether the classic membranes had as many people as we originally thought. And I'm not gonna talk about that. Other people have been working on membranes. What I wanna focus on is the Viejo period here. The Viejo periods are not very common. What the, the most important Viejo period site was excavated by the Joint Casas Grandes project. They were working on the abandoned Spanish church dating from the 1600s of uh, San Antonio de Padua, which is about six kilometers or so north of Pacime on the Casas Grandes River. And in doing slick trenches, they ran across a pit house village that has, you know, that has earlier circular pit houses and then a little bit later uh, upright room blocks. Here's one of the largest rooms. And it was uh, very fortunate because it allowed, this one side allowed the peso, the person who was running the Ameren part of the project to have something later than Pakime with the church, Spanish church, and, and the earlier Viejo. There aren't many Viejo period sites. They're not very common. And that's what has led people to think that the Viejo population was very low and something odd happened that caused Pakime to suddenly explode and become very important. I think that needs to be revised there is in increasing evidence that the Viejo period was larger than we thought. Here, for example, is a pit house that was excavated at the Calderon site that Jane Kelly and her crew worked on south of Pakime in this area, more central Chihuahua. Large sites, large structures, a very impressive site. Closer to Pakime, there aren't that many uh, uh, Viejo sites. But I think there are a lot more than are initially, uh, we would initially think. Mike Searcy and Todd Peitzel are doing a project now on um, a Viejo period, specifically around Pakime to get, help understand what's going on. But in the sites that we excavated, and we focused on membrane sites, 
uh, once we excavated the rooms and mapped them and everything, we would subfloor, that is take the floor out and see if there's anything below the floor. And quite often we found Viejo pit houses underneath medio period uh, communities. And so you, I, we think you don't see Viejo because they're masked by a much uh, stronger, perhaps larger mem uh, medio period occupation that you just can't see them because they're buried in, uh, by a later occupation. And so the Viejo, it's not clear that the population is actually that much smaller. And in fact, there's some new interesting information or dissertation by a person named Offenberger from 2018. I haven't read the whole thing, uh, but her, her, generally she looked at isotopes, strontium and oxygen isotopes, to see if the of human bones, to see were they local or were they people from outside. And of the Viejo burials she uh, remains she studied, 91% were local. About 8% came from elsewhere. And they could have come from anywhere. People move around, as Kathy Cameron talked about. Interestingly, in the Medio period, 87% of the people are local. So there doesn't seem to be a in big influx of membrace people. Seems mainly you're, what you have are people born in the Casas Grandes area, and that's the main population. You can have some outside people from membrace and other places coming in. Uh, but it's a small percentage if the isotopic data uh, makes any sense. And perhaps more interestingly is she, uh, the, the elite burials, the unusual special burials, the people there are local, they're all local, which suggests that the ideas that the leaders were coming from Mesoamerica or Chaco just doesn't fit that model, uh, fit the data. And so there can be some population from outlying areas coming into the Medio, to Pakime. People move around. But it was an insignificant and small part. And so some Membrace people may well have come there. You know, I had argued in, in a book that Membrace fell apart because uh, the, they, it expanded during a particularly good climatic regime and, um, and the regime returned to a more normal pattern which caused social disruption. And there's a long argument. And so they were having trouble. And no doubt some of them heard about this great city to the south. And whereas a population where there's great farmland and, and wonderful water and maybe came down, but it wasn't a very large number and the vast majority of Medio people were locals. And so I think the, the idea that Mimbrace was a major contributor either to the ideas or to the population uh, is not inconsistent with the best day that we have now. But let's look at some other comparisons. Uh, and I, well, the point is, I think there are tremendous differences between Pakime and Membrace. So you're hard pressed to argue that Membrace had rich, really much of a cultural uh, effect on uh, Pakime. So the architecture, cobble versus rammed earth. Uh, architectural organization in Membrace are room blocks. In Casas Grandes, they're room blocks with patios and plazas, walls around patios, more like the Ho'okam than Membrace. Architecture, Shape is boring, rectangle, or square in the membrace. And in Pakime, they went crazy. There are rooms, there's a room in Pakime that had 17 walls. And so it's a very different kind of arch room shape. Architectural uh, uh, features, simple doors and very simple hars. In uh, Casas Grandes, you have T, some, some are, strain, uh, some are uh, rectangular, but others are T-shaped doors. You have small hars and platform mounts, uh, platform hars like here, often fairly fancy. And these small hars are interesting because there are often a lot of them that seem to be reused and abandoned and reused. I remember excavating one room where we had 21 hars. Uh, and I'm just wondering if they just did not a kind of a yearly ritual to close out the hearth and build it, who knows? Anyway, the point is, Membrace and Casas Grandes in terms of these features are quite different. In terms of political organization, uh, Membrace was more egalitarian. There's been some argument there were important, particularly important people at uh, some of maybe Galaz and at Old Town. But clearly, I think at Pakime, you have some kind of hierarchy of some people are much more important and powerful than others, though we don't know the exact nature of how that was. The exotic goods, there are some exotic goods in Membrace, and they tend to be found, like shell, tend to be found in sites. In Casas Grandes, there's a lot of exotics, but they tend to have very limited distribution. Uh, uh, Shell is, tends not to be found much at outlying sites. It's in a couple of storerooms at Pakime with four and a half million artifacts. And so there's a great difference in exotics. And I think that's related to the hierarchy. The, the, the elites are in fact accumulating these really fancy things as markers of power and, and authority. 
uh, public ritual space. Plazas, maybe at Membrace, we don't know. That's the only logical thing. Whereas in Pakime, you have plazas, like the main plaza here. You have, no, oh, you have ball courts. Here's the largest ball court in the Pakime area. There was another one to the south down here. And there was a little one here uh, that the Peso thought was an, a, a small ball court. We have a lot of mounds. We have the Mound of the Cross here. Uh, we have the Mound of the Heroes. There's one that looks like a bird. Mound of the Offerings, which had tombs with probably very important people buried in it. There are up to 15 mounds at Paki May. And again, of the 350 sites we have recorded in an outlying area, we only know of one platform mound. And feasting ovens. Here's my favorite as an ethnobotanist, the feasting oven, which is right here. There are also four big feasting ovens up here. So there's a lot of public ceremonial uh, features of you know, different kinds of Casas Grandes that are, are missing at uh, Membrace. How about private ceremonial space? I don't think there are any kivas in Membrace uh, during the classic Membrace. There's a lot of room, there are a lot of rooms at Casas Grandes that probably had some kind of ritual significance. This is called the walk in well. Uh, which is probably not a well, but it's probably a water shrine. There's a, uh, this cluster of ceramic drums. Here is that uh, I, that uh, T-shaped uh, feature. And it wasn't until I saw it in Mexico City that I noticed it's so well made, but it's worn at the base. Whatever they're doing, they wore the base down, whatever rituals they were doing. So there's a lot of various internal ritual features. There's a room that... Uh, they found what they thought were trophy skulls, et cetera. And then pottery. Again, I'm not very much good at pottery. You know, the iconic pottery style at Membrace is the black and white. At Cossets, it's primarily the Ramos polychrome. And don't ask me to talk about iconography because I'm an idiot when it comes to stuff like that. Uh, population size. Membrace may be smaller than it's we think. And Casas uh, during the Viejo period may be larger and during the Medio period may be smaller. There's a lot of questions. Ritual, uh, ritual, specialized ritual sites. I don't know of any at, at Membrace. Uh, actually, there may be one in the boot hill that Pat could talk about. But in Casas, there are quite a few. There's, this is Sierra Moctezuma, the biggest hill just west of Paquime. And there's a shrine up at the top. And then there's a, uh, a trail that you can still see leaning down to this flat area in, a, in something called El Pueblito, which is this really unusual architecture. It's a room block, but it's not built in Pakime style. It's really strange. Um, and then this is a site 242, uh, where here's that ball court with a platform mound, a very unusual mound of dirt, which is the decayed room block. And the rooms are very much in the Pakime style. Uh, I wall trenched one room that had 14 walls. There are these circles around these uh, arcs, stone arcs around it. I don't know what they are. And so there, uh, there's a lot of uh, ritual sites um, in the Casas Grande tradition. I don't know of any. There may be one um, in um, Membrace. Cultural spatial focus. This is kind of a loosey-goosey idea. But I've argued that, and other people have argued, that Membrace was very inward focused, that they, the exotics they had tended to be um, uh, local exotics, they tended to have really strong social relationships within Membrace and, and, and lesser outside of Membrace. Uh, and Pakime was more outward, that is, it influenced uh, tremendous numbers of sites from the El Paso area over to southeast Arizona into Sonora. That's again, just trying to get you a sense of, I think, the expansiveness of, of uh, cultural focus. So Pakime is like Chaco or like classic Hocam, pretty impressive. Is it a unique historical moment that just came out of nowhere or because people from the outside set it up? Or is it a continuation of some long-term trend in Chihuahua? And I think the argument that it's a unique historical moment is beginning, getting less and less in, uh, uh, support because of what we're, knowing, what we're finding out about the Viejo period that it was larger probably more interesting than we thought. Uh, but what really strikes me is, let's go back to the late archaic. Uh, John Roney and Bob Hard had worked at a number of uh, sites, Sierra de, Sierra de Trinchera sites, which are on hilltops. And there's Sierra Juanacana is one they excavated, and they actually have published a book 
uh, on it from University of Utah Press called Early Farming and Warfare in Northwest Mexico. It's a spectacular site. It's uh, 1500 BC, it's archaic. And yet there's this hundreds and hundreds of these terraces. Uh, they have estimated the amount of work to build those terraces and put dirt behind it was equivalent to building a Pueblo Benito during the archaic time. And if you're driving down to Casas Grandes from Hanos uh, or from Ascension, just as you almost get into uh, Hanos, there's a Colonia Oaxaca. And if you look off to the left, it's on a hill like this. And if the sun's just right, you can see the striations. And here is, God, and here is the hill and one of the terraces. Those are built up and they brought dirt from the floodplain, carried it up to, um, to fill in behind it. An enormous amount of work. There's no other site I know about in the Northwest Southwest at this time period that's like this. And so if you had this amazing site during the late archaic and you had this amazing site during the medieval period, it's not inconceivable to think about there's some really interesting things going on in the Viejo period. That is, Pakime is can, comes out of the uh, cultural traditions and trajectories and history of Northwestern Chihuahua. Well, that's all well and good, but it's mostly speculative. And there are several things we know, need to know more about. The membra end of the membrace is one that um, I've written a book on, but other people have studied it, but it still needs a lot of work. The beginning of the Casas Grandes tradition is a critical element. We had a seminar at the Ameren a number of years ago where we had Casas Grandes experts, and the number one thing we all agreed upon is we had to understand the beginning of Pakime. What's the relationship between the Viejo and the Medio? And that's gonna take a lot of work. And for, as I say, fortunately, we have Jane Kelly's work, but we also have the work that Mike Searcy and Todd Peisler are in the process of doing and excavating uh, Viejo period sites. So there's a lot still to be done, but we need to look back shortly to some of the great maestros, los maestros, the really important people in the history of the area, Charles de Peso and Eduardo Contreras. Uh, Charlie de Peso was uh, the Ameren Foundation had directed and wrote up, as you know, the uh, Casas Grandes uh, volumes, which are just an amazing, amazing uh, feat. And Eduardo Contreras was the INA representative who did the mapping and the reconstruction, who is much loved in Pakime. The local library is named after him. And he had the singular honor of, of being buried at Pakime in a little tiny mound uh, that they built. And then our uh, recently departed colleague, wonderful Jane Kelly, who ran a project for decades down in um, central Chihuahua and has did, done really uh, pioneering work. And damn it, she sure knows how to do a field work. Uh, anyway, so we need to think about uh, not only the ancient people, but the, uh, the archeologists who paved the way in an area that's not well known. And with that, I will take questions. Okay. Okay, Paul, um, I do have one question here. Were the ball courts and the mound sites contemporaneous or sequential? Contemporaneous, medial period. Every, everyone we have found, along with the ovens, the feasting ovens are medial. There are some out in the middle of nowhere, uh, but uh, they're, also, they're only associated with uh, uh, medial period sites. And the biggest ones are at the sites that are clearly important centers like Pakime and Site 242. So yes, they're contemporary. It's not like Hohokam. Great. And are there footings under the Pakime walls? Uh, some. They don't, I, I don't, Pakime, I'm not sure. Those things went up at least three, some of them three stories tall, and they're three feet wide. I'm not sure, I can't remember if they're footings under the walls. Some of the smaller sites have uh, footings or rock uh, alignments under the walls. Um, would you care to comment on the possible relationship between Pakime and Chaco and Aztec? Uh, zero. No, I think the Chaco Meridian. I think it's a it's a it's a it's a clever idea. I think uh, the evidence for Chaco elites setting up Casas Grandes. There's almost no uh, the evidence uh, is minimal. Whereas, I, as I say, my, uh, what we, while we look at it, is it's mostly an indigenous. Now, I know the Pakime people, no doubt they knew about Chaco. I'm sure, I'm sure everybody had heard about the great center up in Chaco. 
but I don't see if the leets are coming down, where's the Chaco stuff? I mean, T-shaped doors to me is not enough of an evidence to show Pakime, uh, Pakime elites were from Chaco. And if the uh, isotopic data, that new isotopic data is, is correct, the elites are in fact local. We actually think what's happening is you have uh, a, a, a highly competitive place where family groups are competing for power and prestige and, uh, and they're local. Uh, why else build three stories tall? Because it impresses people. I mean, you saw Pakime, they're not hemmed in. They could do like, they could, they could spread out uh, all over the place and have one story tall compounds, but they build up, which is hard to do and takes a lot of work and it's hard. And they did that, I think, because it is impressive. And there are three, if I had to go out on a limb, there are three major room blocks that are tall. And it could well be that there are three major competing families. And the reason Pakime could compete, what became the center, is because it is, and this is a long article, and I have a book coming out in November on the pre-Hispanic ethnobotany of Pakime, that it was unusually well situated to produce surpluses. And if you have surplus food, you can then use that to build alliances and power. And so I don't see much Chaco about it. I see uh, that there's, a, a, it comes out of the Viejo and the Mesoamerican items that they have are the local aspiring elites are getting these things because they build, they show a relationship with powerful people in other areas. It's a very common way for people to try to get prestige and power to have, you know, have goods that other people don't have. And again, the isotopic data to me uh, just reinforces the kind of view that's local. Okay, um, so how, how many meters long is the longest ball court? Oh man, I can't remember, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I just don't remember. There, there are various sizes of, we, we, were, we spent one wonderful summer just driving around mapping ball courts, it was a great. Um, the ones that Pocky made, uh, are the two of them are the biggest. One of them's been destroyed by an arroyo. Uh, but there are some variability. They're not all exactly good eye shapes. Some are T-shaped, some are just two lines. Uh, but the one thing it, it, they're consistent is they're all oriented north. There is one that we found that was oriented a little off, but uh, regardless if they don't have exactly all the same features, uh, they all are oriented in exactly the same way, which I think is a critical element. I, I'm sorry, you have to check the Picasso's Grandes volumes. I just don't remember how long it was. It's big. It's not as big as the University of Oklahoma Stadium, however. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on the Chaco Meridian theory? Oh, I think I just answered that, didn't I? Yeah, I think you did. Okay. Okay. Um, how about, do you think it will be safe to go to Pocky Bay after this virus? Is it safe down there? I, you know, Mexico is a big country and there are outbreaks of violence when cartels are fighting each other. Um, and so, you know, there's some areas that are unsafe. I mean, do you, would you not go to Chicago because there's some gunshots? You know, it's the same thing. I, go, I will go down any time. Won't, we won't work up in the mountains. We'll, we're, we will actually go to cliff dwellings up in the mountains, but we won't just cruise around the mountains because there's a lot of drug activity. Um, if you're a foreigner, you're, you're about as safe as you can get as you can be. Uh, they, they just don't get much, um, the cartels get a lot of crap if they go after foreigners. It's a lot easier to, to kidnap rich Mexicans and hold them for hostage. So I go down and uh, uh, I just, you know, be, be, be safe and go, to go around to where the tourists go. And I have no, I don't have any problem with it. Okay, here's one. Uh, do you think Mimbris folks who went down there used pre-existing kin connections? Do you think we could see those in those Viejo sites? I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of reasons that people move and kin is one of them, marriage, uh, other things. Um, one of the issues with this is there are quote Mimbris sites in Chihuahua. The question is, what is an embrace site? And it's basically if you find a lot of pottery on the surface. And so, and they have none of them have ever been excavated. So there are peripheral membrace sites. And in Viejo villages, membrace uh, pottery is very, is some of the most common foreign pottery. So there were relationships. 
Um, I don't know the nature of those relationships. That's a very specific question that's going to require a lot more research. I mean, we there's so so little we know about the VA, the basic characteristics of Viejo. That one is going to probably have to wait. Now there is some DNA evidence people are working on. They're doing some DNA work on um, Viejo and uh, Mimbrace uh, uh, burial remains um, and Medio, excuse me, Medio, uh, and we'll. We'll see how that comes. That should be coming out in the next couple of years. So that will be very, very interesting. But the isotopic data shows there's pro there's some outsiders coming out. They're probably coming from the American Southwest, and they could be coming from the membranes. But it's a small group, and I we don't know the actual mechanisms for the connections. I imagine there are actually a lot of them. And did you find uh, food storage areas for large exchange, or was it small family centered? Well. Read the pre-Hispanic ethnobotany of Pocky Man as neighbors. Um, there, we divide the economy into two parts, and including storage. Uh, one is most of it's domestic. That is families farming small fields for themselves. That's the vast majority of it. But we also have evidence of what's called cacique or cheese fields. This is the first time those have been, I think, recorded in the Southwest and Northwest Mexico archeologically. They're known ethnohistorically. That is, these are fields that are controlled by leaders and, and worked by commoners. And normally those things, uh, the, the yields from those are controlled by the elites um, and, and apportioned out in a variety of ways for ceremonies or to help people who aren't doing well. Uh, the one, one site that has, um, one site that had the, one of the, the special site, 242, that had huge fields probably cheese fields, had a large number of ceramics with interior pitting, which may be from fermentation of alcohol. So they may have been using some of that, uh, some of the surplus for that. So the actual storage, uh, there's potentially a lot of storage, uh, but it's the field systems that really, I think, indicate uh, the organization of production of, of agriculture. Most of it's domestic small fields by, um, by families and a few really large fields controlled by uh, some uh, leaders of some, in some fashion. Okay, there's two more related to food um, and oh, you've good. answered some of it, but what were the main food staples? And besides agave, what other evidence is found in those giant roasting pits? Well, um, the corn, beans, squash, cotton uh, are the clear crops. Uh, agave, we can't say for certain was a crop, though it's likely, but what's actually interesting is the first evidence of pre-Hispanic chilies. We think of chilies as something that's quintessential Southwestern, but in fact, the only evidence for ancient chilies before the Spanish are from some of the sites we excavated. Uh, the Spanish brought chilies up from Central Mexico. The Spanish and, the, and, and their Indian allies brought those up, and the only place we find it is in the two sites in the Casas Grandes area. There's also something called little barley, which is a, a, a crop that's not very well known. It was grown in the whole Camary, Eastern North America. There are a couple of seeds from um, uh, Four Corners and we have one from Paki May. Now the ovens, we don't know. Uh, the field records for the big oven said it was filled with agave and so tall, which are not the same plant, but they didn't save any. So we, we, we just have the field notes done by somebody who uh, may have been right, but we don't know what competence they have. So we actually don't know for sure what was in those big ovens. Agave is the logical plant that was being cooked in those ovens, but that's, that's, there are other, we have to keep options open that there may be of other uses. Okay, I'm gonna to switch topic here for a second. Can you talk to us about the serpent mound at Pakime? Oh, that is so cool. Uh, I think I was, it was my fifth trip to Pocky that I actually saw the thing, I noticed it. It's this, what, 60 meter long undulating low mound that's maybe you know, 30 centimeters high, that it's a horned or feathered serpent. It is so interesting. If you actually go to Google Earth uh, and focus in on the site of Pocky and go to the far, there's a room block called Levin, which is on the far west side. And just right past that is the Serpent Mound that I believe you can see on Google Earth. Um, there are a number of zoomorphic mounds. There's the Mound of the Serpent. There's also the Mound of the Bird, which is 
uh, looks like a decapitated bird, which is probably is what it is because they decapitated turkeys and, and other birds as sacrifices. And if you look at it, the uh, mound of the bird, it looks like a decapitated bird. So there are at least two um, zoomorphic mounds. Most of the mounds tend to be geograph uh, between, between uh, ge uh, geometric shapes. So uh, I, it's, it's a feathered serpent or a horned serpent. There's arguments which it is. I, I have no opinion on it, but it clearly is. Uh, and there are lots of horned or feathered serpent imagery on Casas pottery. So it's a very important icon in, in uh, Pakimei. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, did you find burials and what did they tell you? Well, not many burials because the sites are looted badly looted. Uh, now I've worked in Mimbrace where they're really looted and a lot of them have been bulldozed. So when we got to Casas Gratis, we were just thrilled to see it's only hand potting. Um, almost all the sites have been, I only know of one site that doesn't have any looting at all. Uh, and, and they're going for the burials and the burials tend to be in the corner of the rooms and they dig down, find the wall, uh, find a corner and then go down and get the burial. So we find fragments but we act uh, of human remains and teeth, but uh, full burials are really uncommon. Now, the one reason they're in Pakime is it's so deep to excavate. So that protected some of the, the, but ours are all the sites we excavate. In fact, all the sites that I know of at Pakime and maybe one other one are only one story tall. And the looters just know, know to go down, you know, three or four feet, uh, find the corner, find a wall, find a corner, and then, go through the floor and that's, and that's where they're gonna find the pottery. So we don't get many burials that are intact and some that we do, the soil is uh, wet and the, the um, condition of the bone is not very good. All right, just a few more here. Um, can you talk about the DNA studies of Mimbra skeletons from non-NAN ranch ruin? Nan ranch? And were any of the isotope studies done on Mimbra skeletons? No, but hey, Pat, can you talk about Nan Ranch and DNA? Somebody wants to know about uh, DNA at Nan Ranch and isotopic, isotopic studies? I don't know about isotopic studies. Oh. My wife knows D uh, membranes better than I do, so let her answer it. Well, I don't actually um, remember the specifics, but there are a couple of women at Nan who, um, whose DNA suggests that they came from northern Mexico but south of Chihuahua. Um, one of them dates into the 900s as I remember it and one of them is a century or two later and so they're not contemporary. So as Paul says people are moving around um, and that's not surprising people do that um, but we don't see a massive influx of people from Mesoamerica at NAN or we imagine at any other member site. Um, but people do move around and they move long distances. Isn't it great having your own membrace expert at home? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another one about relationships. Um, what's the relationship between Casas Grandes, Pakime, and Villa Ahumada? Um, Villa Ahumada is, is obviously the Casas Grandes tradition. Uh, it has a lot of material culture. Uh, it could have, I think the argument uh, is that it uh, was producing a lot of turquoise. I no doubt it traded with Pakime. The way we conceive of it, Pakime influenced a huge area, including the Amada, and in, up into El Paso and, and even farther east than that, up into the Membrace area with the Animus phase, uh, over into southeastern Arizona and Sonora. It had an enormous amount of influence we tend to think it controlled a very small area. So its political control, its political hegemony actually was pretty small. Whereas a lot of people see a big site thinking it has enormous expansive power. And we, we tend to see it as much smaller that beyond about 30 kilometers, it didn't have a lot of power. It had a lot of influence uh, being the center of whatever religious and political and social relationships that made up the Casas Grande system. Uh, but it didn't have a lot of control. And so Via Amada would be outside that, <clears throat> our argument would have some trade relationships, uh, but it was largely on its own, even though it shared. I mean, my guess is people from Via Amada 
came to Pakimei once or twice a year for ceremonies or something, but, uh, and shared a cultural tradition um, that was centered at Pakimei, but Pakimei probably didn't have a lot of control. There may have been some trade. Uh, I think it was, uh, again, the people worked at uh, Viamata. I think they argued that there's uh, probably turquoise was traded, but don't, I think that's correct. And so there's some trade stuff, but I think uh, in general, Viamata was pretty much just an independent community that had cultural but weak political ties with Pakime. And we have a question just, how is isotopic data gathered? From the bones. Uh, archaeologists use it a lot. They're, and I'm, I'm, this is not my specialty. Certain isotopes of strontium and oxygen, uh, and then you compare it with, uh, you know, uh, the isotopic signature of the local area, and you can look at then animal bones as well. Uh, it's very, com it's a very complicated thing. It's very complex. And so it isn't just uh, simply, oh, look, this bone is local because of this signature. You have to control for a lot of things. Um, it, but it's a very good data set. And with adding that with the uh, forthcoming DNA data will be pretty spectacular. We really, I think, begin to answer some questions uh, that we have the perplexed archaeologists who only had material culture to look at, uh, look at until now. Um, uh, I, uh, I would look at Offenberger's uh, dissertation. You can get it from looking at University of Calgary, Department of, I think, Anthropology. And I say, I have not read the whole thing, but it, it's, it sounds to be a really fantastic piece of work that uh, will answer, begin to answer some questions that we've been asking and haven't had the data to uh, address fully. Um, this is about uh, Medio and Viejo. Do you consider Pakime Medio phase and earlier Viejo phase societies as unique relative to other contemporaneous societies in present day Mexico, rather than the long held view of a developmental connection with groups to the north? I, I don't think there are a lot of connections to the south. There are co the connect, the connect, well, there is a gradation of, you know, sort of pit housey village agriculturalists in northern Mexico going all the way up into the southwest. Um, and out of that foundation, occasionally you get these large uh, complex centers develop, like La Trincheras in Sonora or, you know, the Clo Calm or Chaco or Pacimi, there are others. Uh, and so there are, there's a general maze based village agricultural way of life that extends over long distances, but they're not all exactly the same. Uh, they all have their own cultural tradition. And we have been uh, criticized and fairly, I mean, up front, we tend to see Pakime as a local tradition that had connections with other areas, but the reasons for it being what it is are mostly based on local relationships uh, between uh, villages and family groups. Okay, regarding the special shrines in the Mimbres, you referenced the site in the Boot Hill, which I, presu Boot Hill, which I presume is the West Baker site. But what about yes. the approximately two dozen cave shrines documented by Cosgroves and others? Uh, Faywood Hot Springs, which was full of offerings, and Cook's Peak, classic Mimbres sites also have kivas, just not great kivas, which were mostly terminated in the 10th century. That's a little uh, add-on. Wouldn't you consider those sites as special landscape features used as shrines? Well, yeah, let me, let me clarify. Yes, I mean, peop, people living on a landscape sanctify it. And there are, uh, that's just it's common. And there are shrines everywhere. And Paki May, I, there are shrines. Uh, but when I'm talking about special sites, they tend to be uh, villages that have a special purpose. Let me rephrase it that way. And I don't know, uh, you know, you might make an argument for uh, Old Town having some of that, uh, but you know, it's so torn up, and maybe Galaz, uh, but they are big villages uh, that may have special, like Paki may have special uh, ritual significance or political economic significance. Um, what I'm talking about that I think is unusual in the Paki area, you don't have the memories, you don't have sites, residential sites who seem to be primary purpose seems to be some sort of odd, they're odd and are not just simply domestic sites, but seem to be primarily some kind of ritual locus. 
Uh, El Pueblito is one of them and 242 is another one. They tend to have unusual architecture. Uh, they, have, they tend to have uh, features that uh, uh, you don't find elsewhere. And so, yes, you get shrines because people sanctify the land, landscape. Everybody does that. Um, but when I, and I should have clarified more, uh, been more clear, we're talking about sites that are uh, communities or villages uh, that seem to be whose primary purpose or overwhelming purpose tends to be some sort of ritual or political specialty. We call them secondary centers. And we, have to, we, we know of two of them, and there are probably some others. I, I hope that clarifies it. Is there use of turquoise mosaics? Turquoise. I, I think there are a few pieces. What is surprisingly, what's surprising is there's not that much turquoise. I think there are 6,000 pieces of turquoise from Pakime, and the vast majority of those were in a, in a, um, a pot, a small pot that was buried under one of the water reservoirs. And so it was long argued, one of the arguments was Casas Grandes was a trade center between Mesoamerica and the Southwest. And anybody, oh, and people always ask, well, what the heck did the Southwest send to uh, Mesoamerica? And the argument a long time has been turquoise. And if Pakime was the center of a lot of this trade, you would expect more turquoise and there just isn't much. You do have, you know, some cool turquoise artifacts, but the, in terms of the turquoise, there just isn't much. Okay. Um, back to the isotopes for a second. Um, is there consistency, is there isotopic consistency among the non-local population? I, I, I say I have not read the thing carefully yet. I've been working on another book and I've been focused on that, sorry. Uh, but I, 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 do, I downloaded the dissertation, I'm going to read it. Uh, and so I, 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 should, I can't answer that. I think the one thing she suggests is that they basically came mostly from the north, somewhere in the southwest. But you'll have to you'll have you'll have to read the, the dissertation. And is Cueva de las Hoyas uh, related to Pakime, and how is it related? Oh, you know there are, there are just lots of cliff dwelling sites up in the mountains of the Sierra Madre. It's just lots of them, uh, and some of them are really hard to get to. We didn't work up there because the logistics are really tough and it's not necessarily the safest place to be. The best known of those cliff dwelling sites is Cueva de la Hoya uh, in Cave Valley. And I view the upland areas, medio sites, frankly, as just hinterland, Casas Grandes tradition sites, just like you get in the river valleys away from Pakime. I don't think it's necessarily a whole lot different. You know, they're probably hunting more and doing a few other things, but in terms of, um, I don't think they're particularly different. Uh, De Peso thought that they were a refugium when Pakime was destroyed, people moved up to the mountains. And I don't think that's the case. I think it's just, you know, they're populations that are related to Casas Grandes in small villages and sometimes a little bit bigger villages uh, that basically are related to Pakime pretty much like people in the lowland areas at equidistant, same distance to Pakime. All right, looks like one more. Um, okay. We always look at Pakime from an American Southwest Northern perspective, but how do Mexican archeologists view Pakime and its predecessors relative to the other Mexican sites? Uh, you have to understand that for most of the time, Mexican archeologists didn't care about Pakime, frankly. Uh, when I went in 1984, I went down to the ENA office in Chihuahua City to talk to the director about starting a project in Pakime. A wonderful guy uh, named Guevara. He was the only archeologist in the entire state of Chihuahua. Chihuahua was about the size of Arizona or New Mexico. And there's one archeologist and he was, he was the director. So he, he's done a lot of really interesting, wonderful stuff and he's a great guy, but you know, he, was a min he had a lot of administration. And so, you know, so much of the archaeology has focused on the Zapotec and the Maya and Tenochtitlan and the Aztec, and the Mixtec, and all of that, that northern Mexico was kind of ignored. I mean, it wasn't kind of, it was ignored by Mexican archaeologists. Also, Mexico, as you know, is very highly centralized. The power, the economic and political power is all uh, centralized. And the, inst the university that Ina runs is in Mexico City. And so uh, it wasn't until they started putting a little more money in expanding the archaeology in the north. Um, 
and and so they look at the connections with Mesoamerica. But I, most of the archaeologists I know sort of view it the same way we do, and that is it's a local tradition that has some connections to West Mexico, not so much Mesoamerica, but West Mexico, and has similarities to things just to the north on the other side of the border. Uh, and they often and traditionally had a little more of a Marxist perspective, but uh, not, not as different as you might think because uh, Northern Mexico basically was largely, it was ignored by North Americans and it was ignored by Mexicans. It is an equal opportunity ignoring place. Okay, one more. Um, are there local guides available for hire at Pacume to enhance a visit? Uh, I think so. Uh, we don't need them. Um, you could, there are several hotels that cater to tourists and uh, you can, um, I'm sure they can line somebody up. Uh, I, to put a plug in, we produce this volume, Discovering Pakime, for people like you. It's uh, 12 bucks, it's short, and it's just a summary, uh, and it has a map of Pakime. Uh, but there are guides, there are hunting guides, and there, are, and there are guides that can take you around. Almost any tourist hotel could get you, uh, uh, could get you in touch. We obviously don't need that, uh, since we've worked 20 years in that area, and we know it pretty well. But, uh, you know, you don't, and also various organizations have tours, uh, Ark and Hiss, did a tour a couple of years ago and various organizations do. Uh, so yes, I think if you go down, there's some hotels that cater to tourists and rich Mexicans and they could, they could arrange a, um, a tour for you. And so there's not only Cueva de la Loya or Paqui May and other sites, but there's also Matortiz like the potter you see behind me. And so it's really, it's a wonderful area, good motels, good restaurants. Uh, and it's a very pleasant place to get and see. We, it's like a second home does. And thank, I guess that's it. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, thank we you. Have, we have had people on from different states who are saying thank you for doing this virtually. So that's been a nice benefit to this way of doing it. And we appreciate And I hope the beer and the uh, margaritas were uh, worthwhile. <laughs> All right. Thank All right, you, thank everyone. Thank you very much.